Okay, welcome back. We are uh, WebD6201, that's client-side scripting and in the winter 2020 semester, and it's week 11, part two of our broadcast. Um, we're talking about Express.js, uh, continued. I'm just gonna switch over to what I'm doing here in terms of this. I'm going to share my screen now. This is gonna be the whole screen, which is gonna, which is gonna cause the Tesseract effect. I always like the Tesseract, right? Um, and I want to bring up um, the lab four. I've kind of posted this new lab. This is up now. If you have a chance to look at it, um, it's called the Express Portfolio Site. Um, I've done this lab in different forms um, across a few years now. Um, and I think it's a good one. And I think it's good because it gives you a chance to practice Express um, and getting some content in there about you. So a couple options. One, you can work alone on this one or with a partner. It's up to you. You can create a fictitious portfolio website uh, or you can make it as an option, like it says here, you can work alone or you may you make this uh, assignment a chance to craft your own personal portfolio website. It's up to you what you want to do here. So two options. You can make it a fictitious person. Um, again, let's keep it safe for work. So we don't want like somebody who's not safe for work as a fictitious person. Uh, to put up here, I won't accept that. But anything that's reasonable, you can do that. And if you're comfortable doing it for yourself, I think that's the best use of your time because this way you can promote yourself, um, kind of talk about what your skills are and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't matter if you are a programmer or you want to be a web developer in the future. Um, I think understanding what your skills are and pointing a future employer to some kind of page that is all about you uh, is, is a good thing. Okay, so one thing that this is different is you need to make this live. So this is going to be hosted live. We're going to be talking about hosting live today using Heroku. And we'll talk about how to sign up for that. And I asked you guys to do that earlier. But that's kind of one part of what I'm asking you to do here. The page structure is going to be very familiar. Um, home page, about me page, pro projects page, services page, and a contact me page uh, like normal. One thing I'm asking you to do is make a, your own logo. So you can make one, you can get one, uh, or whatever. I want the page to be about you. So the logo could be something that's very simple. You could use some uh, uh, polygons or whatever to make it up. Um, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, something spectacular. Or if you're not a graphic designer, and most of us aren't, that's okay. Um, it could be something that's simple, just your your initials uh, inside of a hexagon, as an example, would be perfectly fine. Uh, but something that's kind of representative, almost like a placeholder of what you would have in the real world, okay? The new real world. Um, the next part is a home page, which is kind of like a welcome message. Sometimes we also include something like a mission statement. Um, you know, so my mission is to, you know, create great websites or I love, um, you know, some kind of like one statement uh, kind of to talk about what you're why you like to do the things you do or if it's about a fictitious person why why do they like to do the things they do you can find information about people just going on the web and seeing what they say keep it short and simple and sweet nothing too crazy um, an about me page with more detail uh, and I want two things their name or your name in this case if you're gonna be if it's gonna be about you and their image um, again let's make it a head and shoulder shot something that's fairly straightforward and and for you too so if you're going to make your image try not to make it skewed i think one of the things that i've always asked is make your image realistic um, it doesn't have to be massive it could be something that's reasonably sized so it's part of the page if it's a lot of white space that's a negative thing so there's a bit of design in this one a little bit um but again you want to keep it clean right and notice that there's a lot of not a lot of marks for this because it's just content. It's just you playing with the content so you can practice with your with your tools, right? Um, a projects page. So pick three projects that you want to highlight. Um, so things that you've worked on before, things that you're working on now, something that you're proud of, or if you if it's a fictitious person that you're working on, pick three projects that they've they made, link to them on the web, but they should be at least one image for each project and some kind of short description, um, maybe even of your role, if there was any, and the possible outcome. Did you make this thing? What happened? You know, who did you do it for? That kind of stuff. Um, again, this is a couple of assumptions here. Fictitious person, one option. The other option is your, your portfolio, and, and you can decide what you want to do there. Don't mix the two. Don't say, well, I kind of put my face on it, but I'm a fictitious person. I'm Batman. 
Okay, that's not the situation here. Um, although, if someone wanted to say, like, I want to make a portfolio for Batman, all right, if you're really interested in doing that, and if you can make this work uh, for Batman, I'm totally cool. You can make it campy if you want. But um, try and make it as if, if it was for Batman, um, you know, as an example, they're trying to talk about their, what, you know, what their, uh, their role is, what their strengths are, and all that kind of stuff. Because this, that's what we do when we make a portfolio set for somebody. A contact page. How do I contact this person um, or you? And you might have your personal contact information in there. You could have um, additional things like uh, social media contacts if you have that kind of thing. Again, keep it clean. And the contact page should include some kind of form that allows the user to send a message. Again, this form is not going to be uh, uh, kind of active right now at this point. Not for Lab 4, but for Lab 5, we're going to connect the back end. And then you're going to be able to send messages back and forth uh, to the user. So that's where we're going to kind of make these this uh, work the way we're going to do it. Okay. Um, so that is the content part. And if you notice, the content part is worth just putting it together. And what I'm looking for so that it makes sense is 12 marks, right? So it's it's pretty good. Uh, and there's some work to be done here. Uh, it's not just uh, frivolously just putting stuff that I've given you and throwing it back at me. It's not that way. It's actually putting some content together and making it look OK. Again, I recommend highly that you use Bootstrap and Font Awesome and all those kind of things. I'm not marking you for CSS or uh, presentation value necessarily, but it's, if it's really, really ugly, then you know there might be some friendliness friendliness marks that get removed. Okay, um, in terms of your technology, you're going to use Express and Node. All right, so this is not you making a non-Express and Node website. You have to use Express and Node here in this case. Okay, so um, you don't have an option, okay, for this one. Um, the front end must be Express, okay? It's not going to be used with, you're not going to use Angular, you're not going to use React, you're not going to use something else. Uh, I'm making you use the, the Express middleware, middleware framework, and I'm specifically asking you for the EJS template engine. There's other template engines out there, Pug as one of them, Handlebars, and a bunch of other ones. Please just use EJS, and this way we're all on the same page, okay? Um, you're going to use a view template, and I've already given you that, the index.js template, but you're going to modify it uh, for your use. So this is uh, giving you marks for some of the things we've already done, but also you're going to make some changes here. So each page on the website will split into partial files, uh, into its own partial file, and reside in the partial views partials folder, okay, somewhere in there. Um, an express route must exist for each page of your site. Note, you will need to use router.get, which we talked about yesterday. Um, and some kind of res render where you have your view and any kind of local, when it says locals, this locals means local variables, local a local um, object that we send forward. Um, and we're gonna have one, we've already kind of structured this a little bit for you. And your page logic must reside in its own controller file. And I'm, I'm, reg I'm asking you to put it in that, in that index.js page that we made yesterday, all right? So, so that's where, uh, you know, your, your structure, again, to make it work. Um, in terms of site structure, so this is where, there's not a lot of marks here, there's three marks. Uh, basically, I'm paying you to, uh, except the marks are not really regular, I probably should say 111. Sorry about this. Um, so there's not a lot of, of marks associated with this one. Did I make it three marks or six marks? Hold on a second. No, actually, it was right. It just says three marks, but actually, it's six marks. Hold on. Yeah, I thought so. So yeah, so it's six marks, six marks uh, site structure. And what it is is, I'm basically telling you, hey, look, make it so that you use your uh, EJS templating engine to make this uh, to make this structure uh, kind of happen. And I'm 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 asking you to put things, your JavaScript, your CSS, and your multimedia asset files inside separate folders in the public folder. So I'm basically specifying how I want this thing to be structured. And and you might say, well, Tommy, you've already given us this. Yes, I have. But there's going to be somebody out there who's going to decide to do their own thing um, for whatever reason. And what that's going to do for me is going to make my life a lot more difficult to manage. Because in terms of when I start start marking this stuff, and if it's very, very different, then it becomes very challenging for me to look through and compare um, you know, with fairness. OK, so that is uh, part three. Part four is internal documentation, which we talked about before. Please include the name of your partner if you have one. Or if you're going to work on your own, it's okay. You can you don't you just have to include your name and all the st stuff that I've asked for before. 
Now, this is where it gets a little different. GitHub uh, for version control and four marks for cloud hosting. Okay, so we're gonna talk about how to cloud host today, how to do that. Submission requirements, um, your website's project files uploaded to DC Connect. A link to GitHub repository is required and ensure that each partner is a collaborator so that you have to know how to do that. And a link to your live portfolio site hosted with the cloud provider, and it should say of your choice, not or your choice. Okay, I don't know why that happened. But that's really it uh, in a nutshell. It's worth 41 points and it's worth around, and I'm gonna say around 12 and a half percent of your final grade because I'm gonna rebalance the, the lab so there's only six of them. Uh, sorry, five of them. Three that you've already done. One that's actually due this, uh, this Friday for people that were here yesterday. Um, and then this one will be due next week on Saturday. All right, so you have a week to get this done. Uh, we just talked about not having work to do. Here's some work to do. Um, it's not a lot. Where the challenge is gonna be for you is putting it up, making it live, and making that content appear the way you want it to. Um, you're gonna notice there's gonna be some errors that come through because once you start playing with this stuff and changing things around, um, you're gonna break something. That's what's gonna happen. And once you start making it, you're gonna have to learn how to fix it, and this is where the learning comes in. Even though it seems simple, and most of the stuff I've given you uh, it could be a cut and paste operation, there's going to be some things you're going to have to do on your own uh, to learn. Okay, so let's go back to this. And I'm going to go in here and stop sharing my screen. There we go. All right, so questions about this. So I know there's uh, only a few of us. Um, I'm looking at the chat now. So... Again, we're live on web on, on YouTube. So if any questions around how, what this is going to happen, marking schemes, all that stuff. Um, good. Okay. So what I've done, and just letting you know that again, I've rebalanced the stuff that we already have. So I've rebalanced the labs. So there's only five of them, and on your uh, DC Connect, they rebalanced, and I've rebalanced the tests. So there's only three of them. Okay. The labs, all the labs together, which are all the assignments they're going to be worth 60% of your final grade and your tests are going to be 40% of your final grade all together. When, I, when we add everything together, separate those things out, right? So um, rebalancing the stuff you've already done, if you've already handed it in, I've just proportionally raised the level so that they're all inside the same uh, range. I think if you're doing well, you're still doing well. Um, if you didn't hand in lab one and two, you still didn't hand in lab one and two. It's not gonna you know, change that for, for, uh, from that perspective. The good thing is, the good news is, lab four and five are gonna be worth 50% of your lab, uh, your lab mark, right? That's the idea behind it, right? So uh, behind, between this one and the other one, right? So you're gonna see how that works out. So if you do really well in lab four and lab five, then it's gonna make up a good portion of your lab mark and you should still pass with a decent mark, okay? And like we talked about yesterday, um, assignment so the final test so far is I'm, I'm gearing it towards like this true false multiple trace thing i i want to make it practical i just want to see how you guys are going to handle lab four and lab five and if lab four and lab five are done uh, better then we'll just go back to practical for the final test which is just like an in-class assignment that i'll have during this time here i'll be here just as a moderator at that point just to help you out okay but again my plan is because i'm going with what everyone else is doing uh, is to make the final test a multiple choice true false kind of uh, of test. Okay. Any other questions around marking schemes and the stuff that we've talked about? If there's any concern, please again, I, I highly recommend please con contact me, connect with me. I want to make sure everyone's comfortable and no one's freaking out. Okay. All good. Excellent. Okay. Great. Let's continue. So that is assignment or lab four. All right, which we. We talked about yesterday so that's been posted now so I want to get into let me just go back to resuming my screen sharing here okay and I want to get back to this all right so let me close this down all right so one of the things that we want to talk about is where we less left, left left off so let me just bring up our our app from yesterday because I want to continue with this So here's here's where we were. We had this. We're using this mark, this numbering scheme. So we're at less than ten. It says less than ten. We're really less than eleven, but I'm just you know using the same number, so we don't miss something out. Okay, this is where it is. 
And you can see what we had before. If I do node mon, that's weird. If I do node mon, then what happens is it starts um, my site. It points to my server.js. And then what I can do is if I go up on the web and look look at localhost, so go localhost 3000, then I get this, right? And this is what we had before, home, whatever. Now, what I'd like to do is last, last day, what we did was we did a couple things with EJS and uh, we have this this uh, site structure home uh, products services and, and when I click on these things all they do is give us a response right so the response is hey let's integrate or or um, I don't know construct a website with our templating engine okay so you can see all these are get requests that I'm doing and we're getting responses back from our custom little server we've made right so again here's our server So this is nice. And um, again, I think what we're gonna continue to do with this is we're gonna build on on this project uh, this week and next week as we move. Next week, we're gonna handle uh, MongoDB. We're gonna start with Mongo. And then over the, the last couple weeks of class that we have together, we're gonna use um, kind of, we're gonna talk about uh, CRUD with uh, by having a um, kind of some kind of um, a model and we're going to connect to MongoDB, and then we'll have three parts of our mean stack. Remember, the mean stack was Mongo, Express, Angular, and Node. No Angular, because we can't do that this semester, but we can do Mongo, Express, and Node, the men stack. Anyways, Mongo, Express, and Node. So we haven't done Mongo yet. We're going to talk about that next week, but this week, what I want to do is I want to get you guys online today. That's one of the things I want to do. And, and the other thing is, we need to do some reorganization as early as we can. Okay, so, um, yeah, yeah, we, we have to do some reorganization. So, so if you notice here, we have, um, you know, kind of our, here's our controllers. We have our node modules, um, our public routes and everything else. I want to get rid of users, the users route right now. Well, we're going to put it back later but we're going to get rid of it. So let's just delete it. So again, we're in hey, we're still restructuring here. So move to recycle bin sure. So there's no more root route for index.js, okay? So or sorry for um, for users.js. Uh, now normally that'd be okay if we were deleted it, but however, if you go back to control backtick, um, we've deleted something and if I restart my server here, right? You're going to see that it's going to crap out, right? It's going to stop. And the reason why this is crashing now is because it's trying to look at, um, it looks at the require stack, and this is very interesting what it, what it does here. And it says, okay, so I have my server and my server accesses my app and my app tries to get to something that doesn't exist anymore, which is user.js in the routes folder. So let's modify my app going into app.js. And notice I have this require, I'm gonna remove it. Okay, that's what's going to happen. So it's going to remove that part and press save. And if you notice going back, right, um, I'm going to restart, right? And again, you can see it's crashed. It says waiting for changes. And it says there's another part of my app on line 24. Again, I'm doing this so you can see how the debugging works for node because it works differently than what we've used to here it's in the console now it's not in the web page because we're not using index.html anymore right at least not for this stuff so notice it says app use users and then users router right so whenever I go slash users I want to go to the users router okay interesting so let's go back to my app.js on line 24 and see what that looks like there it is app use users route users router is using users. Well, guess what? Users doesn't exist, right? The slash users. And that's what's giving me, um, there's no users router either. Notice again, I've got no code hinting here to tell me that something is missing. Okay, so we'll remove that as well. And there's no other uh, references to users. So now we should be good, save. And if I control back tick now, you can see that we restarted our server successfully. And if you can, if you wanna try that, you can say RS, which is re you restart right that's what it does and you can see that it restarts our server and if I go back out to my page which is this one and if I refresh then we're still good right and I've just removed something okay cool so 
now that I've removed something and we can do this, what would be really nice is, again, if I can, you know, reorganize things in terms of, um, you know, my, my site, right? So how am I going to do this? So I've got in my views folder, I've got content and partials, right? Partials, and I told you to put them in the partials. I mean, it doesn't matter if you put them here or if you put them in the content for your assignment, it doesn't matter to me if you want to keep it like this. Um, as long as they're inside the views folder, I'm good. But we have a bunch of content here and I want to use it and I want to switch to it. So how do we do that? And again, when we look at the index.ejs page, right, we see this so far. You see a main container with something called main content and an h1 tag. This h1 tag has to go away, right? But I want to do something different. I want to decide which one to inject in here depending on the title, right? So ejs allows us to do a bunch of different things. Hey, finally TDSB is telling us what to do. Yay! So what we can do is is something like this. We can make conditional statements inside of our code, right? So I can say left, uh, so less less than sign percent, and I can do curly braces, right? Or an if statement with curly braces. So I can say something like, just like we normally do, if my title, right? If it's equal to um, whatever we want, for example, home, right? If that's true, then let's try this out for a second. If it, if the title is home somehow, right? Then we're going to make curly braces, right? And I'm going to put the curly brace down here and, and close it off with a percent greater than sign, okay? So curly brace open, curly brace close and the percent greater than sign down here okay almost like I'm doing a command this is think about this as a directive I'm doing here inside my page again this is not HTML I'm doing I'm doing I'm using JavaScript in a way in fact this thing is almost like a script that's what it's more moral than anything else okay so if the title is equal to home right if that's the title then I want to do something we're gonna close off this one with the percent greater than sign, right? And we're going to open this one up with a percent sign like this, okay? So why is that? Because basically this is our closing tag and this is our opening tag and anything in the middle happens conditionally. When I, anything I put inside here will only happen if the title is home. So I can simply say something like I want to inject or include, so percent right include dot slash partials actually we'll say dot slash content which is where it is and again if you look in the content we want to look at the home dot ejs so we'll say home dot ejs right and then percent so that's what I want so if it's home well let, let's inject stuff in here inside this main content area all right let's see if that works so just doing one thing at a time is what we're doing okay so going back, if I click home, then we get, we're good, right? We got our little content and it's injected in there. So this is a mechanism. This is one mechanism that we can use to, um, to basically inject content. Now, I'm going to be sadly telling you that there's no switch case with uh, EJS. One thing that uh, EJS does not have, and again, if I was to look at that with you, let's say if I said uh, EJS, right, switch case, and if I looked at that, um, there isn't an EJS switch case, but there is an if else like we normally have. So if you look at um, the embedded JavaScript stuff on the web, there just there just isn't a switch case statement that you can use. All right, why is that? Because EJS is not JavaScript, right? EJS is a templating engine. That's what it is. So it doesn't have that capability, right? There is no switch, right? Um, at least there used, didn't used to be. And, and to know this, let's, let's talk about this. Let's, let's try it out, right? So imagine if instead of using this, we use the switch case, all right? So again, um, let's just cut this out, right? So I'm gonna cut it, and I'm just gonna try the same thing with the switch case. So let's say if I put a switch in there and I'm gonna switch on name, 
right? Which is what you would expect to do. And then open curly brace, we can kind of do one of these and then put the these kind of symbols, the markup around everything, right? We can do this. And then how do you do the cases, right? Well, we'd have to do each of the cases would have to be in there as well, right? So you'd have to have uh, some kind of percent, you know, as an example for each of these cases. And you'd say something like case and whatever the case would be, for example, um, home, right? And then you'd have to mark this off, right? Just like you normally would, right? Okay, I, I just want to point this out to you so you can see the problem that we're going to have, okay? And then in here, we would have that same stuff, which is, okay, I want to include, right, dot slash content and then slash uh, home.ejs, right? Yeah, that's what I'd like to do. This would be perfect, right? If I could do something like this, switch case. Um, and then it look it looks nice. But if I save this and I go control back tick, right? So right now we're okay. We haven't gone there yet. But if, once I go there, if I go back to my page and if I refresh, then it's going to break. Okay? It says unexpected token semicolon. Okay, let's take that semicolon away. I don't think that's the reason for it, but let's just take it away because there's no semicolon. Let's say, hey, excellent. And if I go back and refresh now, and you know, we're going to see that, well, a couple things have happened, right? Let's just restart. Here we go, restarting. And if I press reset, reset, or refresh here, I can press refresh as much as I want. You can see that it's, it's giving me a 500 error. 500, remember what 500 error was? Server error is what this means. It says, hey, I don't know what you're doing, man, but this thing that you're trying to code with is no good right so this we'd like to see it work like this but it doesn't it doesn't what we need to use instead because it makes sense is an if else if else so that's when we're going to go back a little bit on on this so again going back to what we had let's just undo this and go back to what we had if i was going to go with the next one then it can be only one or the other right so i've got this then i would say else if right and then you put in the, the title if the title is equal to let's say about right I'm just gonna and again it doesn't have to be this particular um, we're gonna make the curly brace open here so curly brace open right so remember this is the way it is because think about each of these things I'm just putting this out here for you guys this is kind of the Part, the first part of the directive, this part is the other part of the directive, and this part is the content, the things that I want to do if this directive is true, okay? Or I want to show. I could show some content here. I can actually show uh, HTML in here. I can do whatever I want, right? But the content should be separated by this structure. So again, um, let's suppose there's only this, uh, this uh, else statement that's in here, this condition. So then I'd have to close it off like this. Again, um, this opens it up. The open, opening bracket is here. For this one, you have a statement. The closing bracket is at the beginning. So this closes off this particular case, this scope right here. And then you have the next condition, right, with an opening bracket and the closing brackets in here. So then I can include something else. So this works. So if I say, well, okay, we'll include about then, right? So let's try that. So both of those things can work. And again, control back tick right let's just restart the server you can see that that's going to happen and then if i go refresh it's going to show me this and if i click about us then it should be about my about page would come up okay and again not to belabor the point but you can do the rest um which is part of your assignment to kind of show different parts of your page okay questions around this um Yes, so to answer Spence's question, so for every statement, do you need to enclose it in a less than percent and then percent greater than? Yes, that's the question, that's the answer. It's very much like PHP. That's why I'm showing it to you, actually. I'm showing it to, I'm keeping EJS because it's so much like PHP. So if you've done PHP before, then this should be no problem for you, right? Because you understand how it works. Um, okay, so that's one thing. And then you want to wrap everything in it says in uh, in one instead of having like three of them uh, line after line. Um, 
kind of. And I want you to put some code up there to show me what you're talking about, like in, in the chat, and then, and then we'll talk about if that's possible or not. But you can also look it up. Hey, Steve, I see that you're here. Um, welcome. Okay, so are we good so far with this? Are we good with uh, with this kind of structure, which is really what we're doing. We're just kind of using an if statement to go through and then decide, um, you know, as an example, um, if it's this page, then do this. And if it's that page, then do that. Okay. Where this really pays off, this real structure, is not just in content, but also inside of our partials. So, for example, remember our partials? We had this idea of in our foot, in our header. Let's go to our header for a second. And um, we have this, right? So we have nav links. And where you can do it really interestingly is you can check to see if the title what the title is again and if the title is home um, then instead of using JavaScript the way we've done it before we can just use EJS and Express to help us out because we have our we have our structure right here so what I could do is the same thing right so here I'm, I'm sitting inside this file header.ejs as an example which is just our navigation and what we can do with it instead is do something like this if the title is home then you're going to show whatever the line is going to be. And you're not going to use if else here. It's only if. And the reason why there's no if else is because you're only going to hit this navigation once. You're never going to go back to this navigation again, right? Because the navigation bar is injected every time you switch, uh, switch over to a new thing. So it's only ever going to be one type, right? So, so that's what you can do. So you can you don't have to use if else. You can just use ifs if you want. So it could be something that looks like this. So if, and again you can wrap this in uh, curly brace percent. Sorry, I like like to call this like um, kind of less than percent or angle brackets. We also call them angle brackets. So we can say that if my uh, title, I'm just switching it on title again, is equal to uh, again, hello, home, right? My title's home. Um, then I'm going to I'm going to I don't know phone ringing just a second all right that user's gone all right um so let's do this right here we go so yeah so we can start like this so if home then I want to show this list item okay however however what if it's not home right if it's not home, then I want to do something else, right? Then I want to show the other list item. And let me just show this uh, here. So I'm going to say that percent curly brace, the closing brace here, right? I'm just encapsulating it in this thing, all right? So this is the if statement. So only if this is true are we going to show this list item. But what about if it's not true? Well, then I want to show the other one, right? And this is where I can do an else, right? So I can say that if, if this is true, cool, else else then show a different list item I can swap out one for the other and I'll tell you the difference right now they're the same but let's talk about what we can do a little bit different okay so instead of saying my nav item uh, is the way it is I can say well nav item and then and I can say active right like we said before right because remember we added the active class to the nav item when that particular uh, link is active so home will be highlighted now let's see if that's if that works so I'm gonna save this again go back out here click on home and you can see now that the home link is active why I'm at home it says home so then because the title is home I've activated my I've injected or changed my code right so that the nav link is active now you could I mean, I put this whole thing in here, but you could break up this this whole uh, stretch of code here, and because there's a lot of repeating code, and the only thing I'm really changing is this uh, this class active, right? So I could separate this code out so that you don't have repetition here uh, to make this happen. But I'm just making it easy for you by just replacing these entire list items with whatever I want. Questions around this? All right, so. Exactly. Use for logout. That's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to use for logout. We're going to say, hey, 
in case we're lo logged in already logged in then you know we're going to show a logout link as opposed to a login link so login and logout will only appear if you know this this thing so this is where it works great okay so again i want to do this structure for each of those things so i'm going to just do the same thing copy and paste for this stuff and again it's a little bit tedious but again if it's products and then you know you can kind of do this you can kind of do this thing let's practice together so again i'm just going to kind of do this it's the same structure again it's some copy pasting but it's not so terrible right and then what we can do is copy this and different list item for this one and the first list item is going to have a, a nav of active right that's definitely a way of doing it so you can do that for all of them um, here's the other thing right if and, and, and this is something that I, I want to talk about with you as well right we can also inject um, code right in here right so for example right now I have my uh, title right and my title is the only thing that's coming in right so we can be a little bit um, and I'm just gonna show products for a second to show that this works okay so so save and go back out here and then I'm gonna click on products and you can see that well product should highlight let's see if that works so and what did I did I say products and this is another thing I gotta make sure that uh, products is spelled properly I think I made it capitals right because it's, it's an if statement right and let's go back to home right and then go to products and I can see products is highlighted yeah great um, but where this is very interesting is what you can do with it if you're creative you can go into the routes and in, the, in my index.js notice that when I go to display products remember display products that's inside of my controllers folder here's my controllers folder under index.js I'm gonna to go to display products and you see that the only thing that I have here is my title and it's just a different title every single time right contact products I mean, I mean I'm really not using the content very much here really at the end of the day the the content is exactly the same but it might not be the same for uh, my contacts later on but you can see that the contents not the same right or it I mean just the title however what you can also include is here is um, you know anything else you want to put in like an active class right so I can say well if my um, my class is act I can put the active class in there as well I can put like kind of another um, the class to be replaced to replace the other one with so for example I could say that by default you know there is no uh, my, my regular class is you know um, the other one nav item right but what I can do is I can actually change the 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 class to, so it includes whatever I want and so that might save us some some effort now what I'm talking about is here so inside of my partials let's go back to my partials under my header for a second so here we're just modifying each one and it's kind of brute force right but wouldn't it be nice if we actually changed this because that's the only thing I'm, I'm, I'm really changing I'm not changing the entire thing just this part right so so basically if my home if my home link has anything right as an example then I want to inject it in here the challenge is that um, you know I what I, what I want to do is I could split this off right so I can do something like this right so right now this part my anchor tag is going to always remain the same right so here's my anchor tag okay but my list item this part of the list item is the thing that's changing okay so this part's not changing only this part's changing okay so therefore that's the only part that I need to include in my else that's what I'm trying to say and so the way to do that would be like this so get rid of this cut it out of here put it here it's a little bit different in terms of our coding and that was just the way I we had it before was a little bit more clear okay and then just get rid of all this and so your if statement really it works on just the part that needs to change does that make sense so that way just the beginning of the list item is the thing that's changing not the rest in fact if you really want to go crazy you don't even have to include the the home ID you can put the home part at the top right when you construct everything and then put the other part after however let's just keep it like this right because this is what's actually going to be the way it's going to be constructed 
okay? So if that's true, the pattern is a little bit easier, right? So again, um, we don't need all of this to be repeated, right? We don't need all of this. We can put that at the bottom. We only repeat that once. We only change the first part of the list item, the opening tag. So the opening tag will be different every single time, but the, the closing tag is going to be the same. Does that make sense? Hopefully you guys understand what I just did. Okay, I guess no one says anything, so we're good to go. Let's keep going. So I'll do the other ones. So again, here's products, right? And we'll just space this out a little bit so we can get all this done. It's going to look messy, but we're building this up, right? This is the way um, it's going to be done in the beginning. We're going to try and learn as we go, right? This part to, to, to be uh, cut out. So I'm going to put this back down here, right? And the last part is going to be the part that I want to change. So I want to copy this and put it there. I want to put a closing brace on the bottom. I'm just constructing. You can see I'm just building up my what the code is going to look like by just being a little bit more creative with my nav item active than the way I've done it before. Okay? Let's keep going. And let's make sure this says the right thing. Services. Stradux. There we go. Right? And the same thing goes with here. So this will be about. And again, you can make this. I mean, I'm, I'm just using one single word, but you can make it so that the page makes more sense in the title. And I'm just going to put this in there this time around just to put them all the, the, the piece parts that I need together. Right? And then I can just cut, cut this out and put this at the bottom because this is always going to be true, right? Oops. This part is always going to be true. Whereas the only thing that's really changing is that beginning of the list item, right? The only thing that's going to change is this part. Okay. So put that in there, put contacts, almost done. We're getting there. And again, I'm just copy pasting some of this stuff, which is repeating. So with Express, I think what you've noticed is that there's a lot of control you have in terms of how you construct your page, how the page is built, as opposed to um, what we've seen before with traditional HTML, uh, which is the browser just reads the page all together right away. It kind of goes down. In this case, we have a chance to inject um, whatever code we want into the page at runtime. So we create this first, and when we get when the user sends a, re a, re a re request to the server, the server responds by constructing the correct page and sending it back to the user. And that is the thing um, that you should capture in your in your mind about how this whole thing works. That really what we're doing here. And by the way, um, and what Heather said is true too in the chat, which is, hey, what if I'm already logged in? I can have another kind of uh, you know conditional statement in here. Um, to check to see if I'm logged in and I'm not going to show the login page or the login link anymore. I'll show the log out link as an example. For now, there is no such uh, way of doing that. So I'm just going to leave it uh, leave it alone and then just put that in there. And if I didn't make any mistakes in a second, we should see the effect. A few seconds. I had a question in the chat. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, could you do class and then percent variable? Yeah, yeah, you could. But remember, what you'd probably want to do instead of having uh, the question marks like outside of the variable, the question marks are a string, right? So at the end of the day, if, if what you're passing in is a string, you just literally can have class is equal to less than percent um, and equals to whatever the variable is. Yes, you could do that. That's definitely a way you can do it, right? So that's what I was saying. You could do that, but the, the challenge is, remember that it's only going to inject stuff when it's true. In this case, right? So that's where you have to kind of figure out how how to do that, right? And this is might be the easiest way to figure this out, um, as opposed to any other way. One thing you can also do is we can't do switch cases here, but nothing is stopping us from using a switch case. In the, in the router, 
right? Because the router is JavaScript, right? So we could definitely do switch case in there. That's definitely another option for us, right? As opposed to, did I mess up? I did. Oh, no, I didn't. Um, yeah, because then what the router will do is the router can switch everything for us. Um, and that's totally a cool thing to do. So what I mean by that is you can have a switch case where depending on what the ID is, and this is kind of what Heather was saying yesterday, you can detect what that is and then have some kind of Boolean or some kind of uh, enumeration or something else that detects what switch, what, what uh, um, state we're in. Are we in the about state, the contact state, the login state? Where are we? And then depending on which state we're in, then um, it could have a different effect. Okay, so home product services. I think we got everything. Let's make sure that it's all named properly here. It looks good. Let's see if this works. We, this could just crap out on us, right? So let's see what happens. So I'm gonna go back to here and refresh. Looks like we're still good. Home works. How about service? Service is okay, about us, right? contact us and log in. So now you can see that that is all good, but whoa, that's weird. We've lost, contact us doesn't actually do a contact page. Services doesn't do a services page. And look at that, and this is okay, but this is some, something, something's wrong there, right? And, and again, to check this out, we can go back to here to see what's happening. Because remember, it's going to be, so 200 is okay, it says, right? And we're trying to inject, oh yeah, of course, of course not, because we didn't put those pages in. Haha, <laughs> nothing is wrong. It's just that I haven't completed it for you. All right, so if I go to my, again, index.ejs, I've only switched these two things, right? Home and about. Okay, so notice I'm doing this title uh, stuff a couple of places. I'm checking if the title is then I'm injecting content. I'm checking if the title is something else in the header. I'm injecting content in there, right? And you can do that throughout the entire time. Okay. Again, I'm not going to go through this whole process because there's no point. Okay. Because you guys kind of figure this out. It's going to be um, a little bit redundant and I want to try and put this up on Heroku. Okay. So questions around content switching because that's all we're doing here. I'm just content switching. All right. One thing we should check, though, is what happens with JavaScript. Let's do one more of these because we said home and about, but the, where some of my code is in is in the contact page. Remember that contact page? It kind of hooks into a, um, a JavaScript uh, page as well. How do I hook JavaScript in there as well? Well, let's do that. So we'll say instead of this, we'll say else if. Okay, about, we'll say else if uh, contact, right? And inside the contact, we'll inject the contact page. Get that page in there. By the way, you can always use Ajax as well if you really want to, but I, we probably won't need it anymore because of my, our backend is gonna be reactive, right? So home about and contact.ejs. So I'm gonna save this, which is gonna restart my server in a second. And once my server's been restarted, then um, I should be able to go to my contact page. Let's go to my contact page here. All right, so you can see that uh, the contact page comes up. The CSS is okay, but this part is bad, right? And we know where this comes from. This comes from our JavaScript uh, that we had before. And we had that inside of our files a couple of weeks ago. So let's say week eight, right? So inside of our... Um, uh, scripts and our app.js. Let's open that up. So open with VS Code. And here you can see our app. We have our, our contact uh, class. We have that in here. We can still do that. Um, and so why not? Let's just put this contact class inside of our JavaScript page. We'll keep this one open that's inside of our files now. This is our JavaScript page from the other stuff, but we're gonna go into public, inside of scripts, inside of app.js, which we just have this iffy, and we're just gonna replace the stuff that's in here with the stuff we created before. So there's our contact information. And I wanna replace some of this functionality with what we had before too, right? Because you know we don't wanna reinvent the wheel. 
So let's go into that. That's not that one. And I just want to make sure that I have everything. There it is. This is the one. Okay, so again, we have items, we have app, and we have our page switcher. Remember this? And then in our page switcher, we had load page content. And depending on what the content was, we don't need this anymore. This is all the Ajax stuff that we're, we're not using anymore. We want to, all this, by the way, um, this display contact is what we want, right? So again, display contact content. And this stuff right here is what we want to change. The document title, be careful if you switch this, if you actually do this document title stuff uh, in the page, it's totally doable. We can totally do this again. But remember, um, this may have an effect because we're looking at title for other things. Okay, just let FYI. So here we definitely can do this. So I can just grab all this. We also have clear form. We need to get this. This function clear form is only for display contact content. So I'm just going to grab all this stuff here, right? This is the page. And I'm gonna, actually, I'm just going to grab this whole function, right? Because it gives, gives me all this stuff, right? And this is where a large bulk of our stuff was for our contact page. So I'm going to co co copy this page here, right? And this page here is display contact content and then inject it inside of our page here, right? Which we have a start, right? And we can put that in there above start. So that's all of our display contact content. I'm just, I'm just taking it from what we did before. Okay, I'm not rewriting it at all in any way. And it does a couple of things. It's going to look at the contact form, right? And let's make this step through it. Um, the contact form itself is going to be reset, right? In clear form. That's what it does. Validate input checks to see if everything works. That's another little function we wrote. And then we're going to use jQuery to hide or select stuff, all this kind of stuff that we did before, right? And as we go down, we use, um, regular expressions to have our phone pattern and all this kind of stuff, right? So I think for the most part, it looks pretty clean. I don't think there's anything that can't be done. We have a reset button that works and so on. One thing that we have to do is we have to activate this page. So whenever we get to this, whenever we get to this thing, then what we want to do is we want to somehow detect that that page is the one we want. And for this, we have an example of this in my, our page switcher. So going back to this, we had our little page switcher app, right? Which is up here, page switcher, right? Because remember in our start, we had page switcher and then main. So we can just use whatever the page switcher is to uh, to kind of detect the content. So depending on the name in the location path name, right? Now notice our name is only going to be uh, our window location. And our name is just going to be that one part. It's not going to have a, we don't, we're probably not going to do this part, the substring, because our name alone is going to be the thing we want. So let's just grab this code. I'm going to go back to that page into the app.js here inside of our start function. I'm just going to um, I'm just going to console log this, right? So I'm going to console log the name, whatever that name is, and let's see what that is, right? We'll see what the name comes out to be. Um, and the way to check this, of course, now that I've saved this, is going back to here and refreshing. Nothing, no changes yet. But if we look at inside of our, if we inspect the console, you can see that it says forward slash contact, forward slash contact. I don't want the forward slash. That would be bad. All right. So, so going back to this, right, I want to not look at the forward slash. And so if you notice here, I said, make a substring from starting at number uh, from the name, remember the name is actually a character or a character array. That's what a string is. So we're looking at the first character, not the zeroth character, uh, with a name length minus five. We don't have to do that anymore. Um, we just have to make a substring and substring says, what's the start? And the, it's an optional end. I want to start at one, not at zero. All right. So I just need, I can just take this and take this part and go back to this. I'll check the um, chat in a second. Um, I can go back here and I can simply say that substring 
one is what I want. So that is the page name now. So without the last part, because we don't have HTML anymore, right? And then let's see what we get. So if I save this going back to here, and if I refresh, and let's look and see what we have in the console, you can see that, okay, we're still getting contact. Did I not save this? Auto Sorry? Auto oh yeah, thank you. You're the best, man. Thanks. Perfect. So we were doing it actually, but we just didn't look at the right thing. Does that make sense? So now that we've done this, right, then I can say simply that I can switch this now. So I can do my little page switcher thing again. So I can say switch on the page name, just like we normally have done. So this is the front end. This is the last stuff that we're doing is on the back end. Express is on the back end. This is the front end. And we can do whatever we did before on the, on the, on the front end here. So we can say case if my page is contact, then I want to uh, display my uh, display contact information, right? Contact content. Sorry, we're talking about D&D. &D. Uh, contact content. There we go. I'm such a nerd. Sorry. Um, make sense? So that's going to be this. I'm not, I'm not going to finish this. I, this is for you to do, right? But at the end of the day, if I go through here, I can display any of my JavaScript that I need, just like we did before with some modifications. That's all I'm saying, okay? So, let's take a look at that. Let me just turn that off so we don't get rudely interrupted by my guys, my buddies. There we go. Okay, so... Does that make sense? So let's see if this works. So let's go back to this. And again, if we refresh, then now is we see exactly something not working. What's not working? Go inspect. And app started. Sorry, so I'm make sure. So contact name is too short. And the reason why is because it's got, got this in there. So we say like Tom, and then it's going to work, right? Tom, and then uh, we'll say Tom at example.com all the regular things that we did last time uh, they should work if I move move over here it's starting to validate it's starting to process the page just like it did before Does it make sense so this is where it's going to help you with assignment number or lab four because lab four is asking you for to make this work you guys got to finish this to make sure it works properly um, it doesn't it's not quite done okay well for the most part this page here where we're looking through here and and trying to get um, you know which page it is so I can use the our front end JavaScript to do some changes that's totally cool okay, any questions around this okay so that should be good you guys should be good in terms of usage I'm gonna just X out of this one because I'm not gonna change anything else right now so again we've got some pretty good stuff going on and I'm gonna put this up on github for you guys so you can see the changes so again I'm going to add us to the staging area so all these are these are all the changes I'm gonna say um, kind of added uh, content pages because that's what we did we haven't finished them all but they're there and then I'm going to push this to github okay so that should give you everything up online for you guys at this point all right so now we come to the next part which is I want to push everything to Heroku so remember we talked about this before. If I go to Heroku.com, um, then you can log in or sign up. So you have to remember your email address. Hopefully I remember mine. And if I don't, I don't know my password, but let me see if I, is, is it that one? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So um, when you log in, it's taking a long time to process my request. But if you log into Heroku, right, for the first time, remember I asked you guys to sign up. Hopefully you did that. And Heroku is taking its sweet time trying to figure things out. I'm not sure why it's doing that. I just tested it earlier. Either that or I put the wrong uh, email in here or password and it's not working. But anyways, what I want you guys to do is if you haven't signed up already, sign up for Heroku because we're going to do the example here today. And if I have to sign up with another account, I will. It doesn't matter to me. Right? But we'll try this in a second. 
Okay, so that was obviously wrong. Let's try one more time. And if not, I'll just make a new one. Yay! Sure. All right, so what I want to do here, and we can ignore this little message. This is a message that I have because one of my, my sites is going to expire. I want to click New. All right, so you're going to come to this point. And by the way, let's see if you guys are with me. Are you guys with me? Are you guys logged into to Heroku? Please go here. Because otherwise, yes. Anyone else? Not, uh, anyone else? Okay, we're good. So when you log in, you're going to click this new button. And it's going to say create new app. Okay, create new app. When I create my new app, i got to give it a name. And I'm going to give it my name, which is WebD. It's got to be unique. 6201 in the winter 2020 semester. You can call yours something else, please. And mine is, uh, we're going to say lesson um, 11. And the reason why it's giving me... Uh, problems is it doesn't like capitals right so these are all going to be lowercase web d6201 and i think we are good right if you notice this is okay and then it says where do you want it region united states so again you have to make lower this lowercase region united states and i'm going to click create create app and if everything goes well i have this screen okay are you with me Oh, you guys, you guys are there with me now. Yes? All good? Excellent. All right, so if you're with me, now there's a few options. One, I can use my Heroku CLI. Yes, it's neat. Two, I can use some kind of contagion registry. Notice I skipped GitHub because that's the one we're going to use. Or three, GitHub. And this is kind of where I'd like to use this GitHub thing. Okay, I'm not going to make a pipeline. I'm not going to do any of this stuff. Remember, we're making a very simple site here. So if you follow the instructions, it'll work just perfectly for you. Let's click GitHub. With GitHub, what you're going to have to do is, for the first time, it's going to ask you to authenticate with GitHub. You need to have a GitHub account. So for me, it's detecting me as me because I've connected with GitHub. It's going to ask you to authenticate, and GitHub is going to ask you to say, do you trust Heroku? and all this kind of stuff. And the answer should be, yes, I trust Heroku, okay? Heroku is nicely owned by um, uh, Salesforce now, which is really cool. Okay, so so now that um, uh, we've got this, I can decide which one I want to go to if there's one that I want to use. So you can see that I have several providers here, right? It says missing GitHub organizations. Ensure Heroku dashboard has team access. So we click onto this. And it says, do I want to give access to, as an example, Durham Programmer? So I want to grant. And then it's going to say, okay, so it's asking me for my password, right? So I'm going to ask my, I'm going to use my password. And then it's going to grant access, right, to Durham Programmer, right? There's a check mark there. And I can add other ones I want. If there's any other organization that I want to add. Notice I have other ones that I've added in, okay? Now that I've done that, and I did this because... You have to do that for every organization or any um, account that you add in, okay, if you're using an organization. I'm just going to skip back now and refresh, right, because I need to do that here. So when I've done this, right, so now I should have access to Durham Programmer. You can see that Durham Programmer comes up, right, and now I can specify my repo name, okay. I can also search for a repo. So if I search, it'll show me all the repos on GitHub. All right, and the one that I want obviously is the one that I'm doing right now, which is uh, 10, less than 10. This one, okay. I can connect with this one. Once I click connect on my on my uh, that particular repository, if I click connect, it's going to say, "Cool, we're connecting now." Okay, great. And this is an amazing thing that's going to happen here, right? I want to enable automatic deploys on the master branch, and that means. When I, when I change my deployment, right, if I update things, and by the way, there's still a couple things we have to do to make this all work, by the way. There's one more thing we have to change. Um, if I change my, my, uh, um, my deployment, as soon as I update GitHub, it'll update Heroku, and Heroku will update the page, right? So it'll be continuous deployment is what this thing is, continuous integration, right? So I'm going to click Enable Automatic Deploys, definitely. And then I want to de deploy my branch. But before I go there, I need one more thing to change in my branch. And I need to change my package.json file uh, for it to be compatible 
with uh, Heroku. And so we're going to talk about this in a second because my package.json file is not her compatible yet. Okay, so let's go back to Visual Studio Code and go out to here. In my package.json, we specified dependencies. We specified the name, um, which is public. That doesn't make any sense. The name should be the name of your app. So please change this to what it's supposed to be. In my case, it's WebD 6201, and then it's W2020, and then Lesson 10. That should be the name. The other thing that we don't have in here is the name of our engine. The name of our engine. And also, how do you start my server? I don't have that in here at all. If I don't have these things in my package.json file, and I'm looking at the wrong thing, aren't I? I am. I'm looking at the wrong package.json. Let me just go back to the real one, which is down here. Yes, that's what I meant. If you don't have the start script, which is this one right here, so this start script needs to be here because it tells Heroku how to start your server. Node server.js, right? You need this part. And then you need another thing, which we don't have, called engines. All right, so we're going to add a new little thing here manually inside of our package.json. And the thing that we're going to have in here is called engines, right? And we're going to specify two engines the node engine, right? And also the NPM engine. We need to talk about which versions of node and NPM we're using. So Heroku knows what to do. Because if I don't specify this, Heroku doesn't know which version we're using and it'll just crap out, it won't build, all right? So to figure this out um, and what version is currently compatible, I highly recommend going with the minimum value of the, the um, long-term support version that's up on, on node, right? So again, if you go up on Node, Node.js tells us that the long-term support version right now is 12.16.1. That is the long-term support version, 12.16.1. And so that is the version that I want to use, not the version that I have installed, right? If you try and use this current version, Heroku may not be up to date with this bleeding edge version, right? It wants to look at this one, okay? And to know which one you have installed, right we can just simply go to control backtick and let me just go to a new terminal window and i can just say node minus minus v right and you can see or sorry node minus v which is 13.10.1 13.10.1 probably not going to be compatible right um instead what we want to do is use 12.16.1 or higher so what we're going to say is here we're going to say we want a, a node version. I'm just going to put this comma in here to, to, to start going. We want a node version that is um, greater than, we're going to use a little caret, greater than 12.16.1. Okay, greater than 1. And if this is no good, we'll may, we may have to downgrade this even more. And then from an NPM perspective, um, let's see what NPM version I'm using. And we'll talk about this as, as, as well. So we'll say NPM minus V. We can see my version is 16.13.1.7, I mean. So probably this, the safe thing to do is anything that's 6 or higher would be good enough. So something like 6.0.0 or higher is okay. In fact, maybe instead of 12.16.1, anything that's 12. Dot zero dot zero or higher is probably going to be better to put in right 12.0.0 so why is this because this specifies it tells Heroku right what we need to do let me, up, let me update this one as well because I messed that one up um, so that way it knows how to run this thing for you because remember it's going to run a back end and you need to be very specific in terms of how this works okay so that's kind of important um, so now what I want to do is put this version up on GitHub. So again, I'm going to say on GitHub, these are the changes I made. Because we're connected to, Hir to Heroku, this is all good. We're going to say um, updated package.json for Heroku. Okay, very important step. And I'm going to click this little check mark. And then from here, push. And now that'll push the latest changes on up online and when this is done I'm gonna go back to Heroku here 
and I want to deploy my master branch. If I click deploy branch now, what it's going to do is it's going to start showing you your deployment script, which is really important. So notice that now it picked it up. Look, 12.0.0, 6.0.0. It's resolving node version 12.0, downloading, installing. Look at 12.16.1. Eh? Isn't that interesting that it did that? So it kind of took the latest version. It installed everything. It's showing you your, your little build for how this is working. It says build succeeded, right? and then it's showing you what it's doing okay great and then once it's done right once it's done this it's going to show you you can view your app on here on heroku and if everything went well i should be able to click this and you should see your site live and if you go there to this site right now webd 6201-w2020-lesson11-herokuapp.com why do we call it lesson 11 by the way who knows um but if you go there right then it should work with the way we have it working, right? The exact same way we have it working, it should work for you right now. And then we're live. We're live on the internet, guys. This is available anywhere in the world. Are you good? Are you good? Do you want me to go through that away? Yeah, so I thought it was cool too. Um, and for me, this is a really important step. It's gonna bring you out of working um, on a machine that's local to working online. Um, before we can use, uh, for a lot of the stuff we did, we can use GitHub pages, but now we're using Heroku and Heroku is enabling us to, to, do, this, to do this stuff. All right, and this is something that is very similar to what you would do for a client. The other thing you can do is you can use Microsoft Azure, Amazon Web Services, Google Platform. Um, if you wanna make your own VM, you can use DigitalOcean. I'm, I'm sure other classes are showing you how to use other uh, cloud services maybe. Anything else that you know how to use, you can make work with your back end for Node.js, okay? So that's uh, really cool. Is this part in the YouTube video? Yes, it is. All of it's being recorded in the YouTube video right now, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, so I, I thought that I thought that this would be something that's that's useful for you guys. So now that you've, again, please try it out if you uh, if you can. See if you can get to my site. You should be able to get to it. Um, and it does most of the things that we've, we've made it to so far. Okay. There are going to be side effects. When you make, when you start using Node.js, um, there's going to be some things that you think are, should be working, but they don't work for whatever reason. And a lot of this testing online is not what you want to do. You want to test your server completely locally first, right? Why? Because we have feedback here, mechanisms that we can look at, right? We can look at um, our log. We can go to our log and take a look at this stuff. This is available to us here. Online on Heroku, we have limited access to this stuff. Limited access. And a good example of this is anything that we want to see here, we have to have a, some kind of console log, right? And notice there's not a lot of console logs going on, right? This get stuff is coming from Nodemon, right? So unless we output something to the console, we're not gonna see any feedback, right? None of this is gonna be output whatsoever, right? Because we have none of this outputting right now. There's nothing inside of our code that generates this. This is something that's node, node mod, right? So in our, up online in our log then, if we want to see what's happening, and again, we can view our logs. So here's my deploying. This is a, a thing for Heroku um, for you guys to see. Notice that we have deploy, right? And there's a lot of other links here that you can look at, not just open my app up, but also some other things. If I click overview, it talks about um, how much this costs, zero dollars per month. Here's my latest activity. And if I click on the activity um, folder or tab, you can see that these are the things that I've done. It shows you a list of, of kind of actions that I've taken, right? So. You can see that I initially I released it here at 4.17 p.m., right? I can always roll it back to a previous version here on Heroku if I want to. I built it here. My build was successful here. And then what I did was I deployed it here and here, right? If I click, if I click to compare diff, it's actually going to look at comparing my changes on my website. So if there's anything to compare, it's going to look back and see what I did. It's literally connecting to GitHub. So GitHub is a really cool, it's a really good way of integrating a direct integration or what we like to call continuous integration. So what do I mean by that, right? So this is a new topic, continuous integration. 
and we're scratching the surface again right like we normally would but if I was going to talk about continuous integration what this means is if I make a change to anything here and I put it up on github let's try this out here all right so let's suppose I want to change my contents so my content inside of my home page where it says welcome to my site you know we're gonna say something like you know h2 and we're gonna say so I want to make an h2 tag and I'm gonna say isn't this cool right isn't this cool it's not really that cool but let's just suppose that I want to make this change so here's isn't this cool once I do this I have a change coming up here which is in my in my source control it tells me that I've made one change to my home.ejs uh, link this is my home.ejs uh, template that I'm using or my content page I'm going to add this to the staging area and I'm going to say updated home.ejs that's the actual thing that I'm changing here I'm going to click on the check mark and I'm going to go to push to github okay let's watch it and see what happens up online while this is happening so you can see that now here's my activity feed okay so what we were looking at, what we we're hoping to see is that, hey, something has changed, right? We want to rebuild my page, right? Because it's got to be automatic, right? Remember, we said automatic stuff. Once my page changes, what happens is, oh, there it is. Look, see that little, that little ellipses? Heroku is watching GitHub for changes. It's like kind of looking at it going, hey, wait, is there a change going on? Well, you can see that, in, in fact, there is a change, right? Something that's happening. My build is in progress here. And as soon as my build is done, it's going to show us that the build is done. It might take a few seconds to rebuild everything. And what this literally is doing is going through everything again and rebuilding the page. Now, if I go back up, right? So if I go back up to my page, which is this one, this is the actual live site on Heroku. And if I refresh, right, you can see that, we'll see, isn't this cool, right? So that's the, that's the workflow, if you will. I can use continuous integration and continuous deployment CI CD in this way okay so this is another way of doing it and now you wouldn't want this to be done when you're working on a website what you probably want to do instead is have two sites one site which is um, your staging site okay so I have a staging site that's internal like this one this might be my staging site and this staging site is only available to developers internally you me we're working on a site together and then you're gonna deploy this same site once you're done, when you're done, you're, you want to distribute this, your code, you want to have your actual live site. Your live site will actually have um, your DNS name pointing to, um, you know, another site altogether where it physically goes live. So you test live here, let's say within a staging area with whether it's Heroku or whether it's a Azure or uh, Google platform, Amazon Web Services, whatever you choose. You have two sites for every site you make. One, which is your staging area you test things out live and then you don't share that with the client or you can if you want to you can say here's how we're doing we're not quite live they have the original site that's live whatever that that site is and then as soon as you you're done making changes on your on your staging on your staging site then what you do is you cut over and you cut everything over to your live site and then all the changes that you made that you've tested are live on your live site and it's a beautiful thing okay so that is continuous integration continuous deployment in a nutshell and it says, uh, I'm just reading some of the comments here. Um, overhead. What do you mean by overhead? So the question I had on the chat was, is the overhead for the cloud services pretty much all the same? The setup process. Okay, yeah. The setup process is fairly similar. I would say um, Heroku is the easiest. Um, I would say Microsoft Azure has become easier to use over the last little while. Um Amazon and Google are slightly more complex, slightly. Um, but yeah, they're all pretty much the same process. From a continuous integration perspective, sometimes it requires a paid subscription. For example, if you're trying to do something like this with Microsoft Azure, uh, in the beginning, Microsoft Azure had continuous integration and continuous deployment as it wasn't part of their free platform. Because by the way, if you go up there, you can get some free services with Azure, especially as students. But continuous integration, continuous deployment with, by looking at Google, uh, by GitHub, or if you want to look at Bitbucket or another uh, version control provider, yeah, that's not free. But the setup process like you're asking about is, is pretty much the same for the most part.
some more some a little bit more complex than others and there's training involved one thing that the great thing about all these platforms whether it's heroku whether it's uh um azure uh or or others is um that there's great training let me show you what azure looks like and by the way have you guys seen azure do you have azure at all in any other any one of your uh um courses like do you have that at all can someone let me know because if you don't then this will be interesting for you guys to see not really okay i see not really okay so only using it to download okay so let me show you what this looks like so if you guys um you guys maybe not be able to do that but if, if i if i was going to go to azure i would go to uh portal dot azure dot com right and what portal.azure.com will do is it'll ask me to log into Microsoft Azure. I'm going to log in with my um, my, gener my general inbox, which, which is what this is. It's going to ask me for my password, just like normal. I'll say keep me signed in. And, oh yeah, of course, I have my two-step authentication code, which is okay because it changes all the time. So we can put that in too. And I highly recommend uh, from a security perspective to use it because at the end of the day, you know, there's so much going on nowadays online. 392, there we go. Um, I'll say don't ask me again on this device, why not? All right, and now you can see that I'm gonna access Microsoft Azure, all right? So Azure is a complete uh, portal. I'm not gonna view my recommendations right now. And um, so this is what Azure looks like as a good example, right? And uh, Azure is pretty cool. And we can do some of the same stuff that we can do with uh, Heroku with, uh, with Azure as well. Um, Azure, of course, is a Microsoft product. It's their flagship when it comes to the way they do things, right? So I want to add a new resource. Then what I can do is if I click here, I can create a new resource. I can also um, I can create, create create a new cloud service or anything else I want. There's also app services. There's uh, virtual machines if I want to make my own virtual machine, which is really cool. Um, but I, I really want to make a new uh, app service, right? So if I go to app services, it'll tell me what kind of app service I want. I can add a new one, a web app, right? It tells me pay as you go. There's different options. You can also go with um, I had I used to have Microsoft DreamSpark, right? So that's kind of uh, what I was using before. A web app is what I want to do, and then it asks you some questions. You can see there's a bit of a questionnaire to go through. Um, you can also specify a I'm publishing either code or a Docker container. Uh, do I have a run stack a runtime stack that I want to use? As an example, you can uh, for, for example I can I have to specify what the runtime stack is. So Node 12 long-term support version see that that's very important to see so i can specify the node version i can specify whether i want to run on linux or windows where i'm creating this little service right so i want to publish with code i could connect to a docker container which is kind of really cool i can look at a specific region so central us or i can specify something else like for example central canada or uh eastern us might be better east us so i can specify that particular place and then um, I can pick a resource group, so Canada East, and these are things that I would have to create ahead of time, right? And then from there, um, my Linux plan, right? What's my Linux plan for East? This is, I wanna basically choose the free one. I don't wanna have anything but free. Notice it says free F1, and that's the type of server. I'm gonna reserve space on Microsoft Azure with uh, a number of uh, CPU cores and memory and all that kind of stuff. It's almost like a shared virtual virtual machine that I'm creating right now, okay? And then of course I have to specify my app name and I want this app name to be unique across all Azure websites. So I'm gonna do the same thing here. I'm gonna talk about uh, the name, which is WebD6201 um, as an example in the uh, winter 2020 semester and it's lesson, you know, uh, we said 11, right? And if it's good, it's going to give me a check mark. This green check mark tells me that it's unique, just like we did with um, Heroku. Okay. So that's the the first part of our check, right? So this is the the first part. 
it says review and create now this creates right here it would just literally create a an empty container there's nothing inside this site whatsoever and notice we can also go monitoring um, do I want to enable application insights definitely not that's an extra step we don't want tags if I want to include other kinds of tags um, and then where where it comes to review and create this is what it looks like you can see what's happening here's my subscription um, this is the resource group these are all the things that I've chosen to do so Spence this is the answer to your question um, as an example and then if I click create it's going to create my deployment right so this is what's happening this is going to create my little service it's going to be free right and it says your deployments underway when this is done I'm going to have a um, some extra information here that I've got to go to because I want to again I want to try and connect it with github and you're going to see that that for the most part is not going to be available to us to do all right but let's just wait you can see that the process takes a little longer now here's the great thing about deploying uh, while this is working I'll talk about this deploying on um, on Azure deploying on Google platform uh, deploying on Amazon Web Services guys I recommend these okay uh, for a couple of reasons yes you can go with a smaller platform you can make your own server uh, mom and pop server in your house and then it can do everything um, however here's what you have to take care of you have to take care of the box so you actually run your server on your own right which is a bad thing you have to worry about rock-solid security and SSL certificates you have to do all kinds of stuff in terms of serving your client could you do it yes should you do it I don't think so not in this day and age I recommend at least partially being on the cloud like this and I think running fully on the cloud with with a service like Microsoft Azure is really the smart way to go and I'll talk about why one because it's scalable if I ever need more than just this free service I can switch to a paid service where I can increase the amount of CPU cores and resources that I want um, so if I get really really busy and now this is a great example of this time this in, in our new day and age here where we can be you know our sites can we're gonna run more on the internet now than almost ever um, so I want to be able to be able to throttle up uh, my my site as we go okay or I can want to throttle it back when let's say things go back to normal it's not as easy to do that with an actual physical box in your house you know or in in a some kind of server room in your company it's not as it's not as easy to do that to throttle back right um, or I want to add more capacity you know for my client I want to add uh, additional things now it's finally been deployed you can see that the status is okay right here's my uh, my app right my operation details um, so it's starting to to deploy this uh, this service for us right but you can see it's quite more a little bit more involved than Heroku okay so let's see if we can actually it's still doing its thing um, if I click on overview as an example you can see that that's what it's doing there's inputs you can also go to inputs um, it talks about um, some specific things my location my hosting environment um, you know as an example um, is it always on right I can switch this to to true if I really want to and so on um, here are my outputs there's no deployment outputs yet there's a template that you can specify it talks about how to create a schema right and everything else again this is all on the back end uh, of trying to make this web service live and it's not quite done you can see it takes uh, quite a bit of time so we'll come back to this this uh, web app all right but more or less when this is done we'll be able to do the same things we've just done by uploading to this empty container right and if again if I go to my dashboard um, you know we we don't really see a web app that's up here right now right but I, if I go to my uh, resources so I want to see all resources let's take a look at all these things right so again here is my my resource I'm just creating which is a, a resource on DreamSpark right pay as you go is me me paying um, and DreamSpark gives me the ability for us to uh, um, you know to kind of look at our our application so this is the application ASP dash Canada East dash AD 07 oh look the deployment succeeded let's go to that resource and see what it looks like okay so um, so here's the actual resource and 
We can, also, we can also look at the activity log here if there's anything that's happened. But here's the overview. This is really interesting. It tells me it's running. I can stop it if I want to. I can restart it. Um, you know, the, the service. It tells me these are kind of a dashboard of, of um, you know, kind of activity, um, how much throughput I have on the site and so on. I also can look at this deployment starts and there's a quick start. If I click quick start, it says here's Node.js. Follow our quick start guide and deploy your first Node.js app in minutes. All right, so we can go to quick start and it actually has a little quick start uh, guide to help you out how to do this. It steps you through how to set up uh, Microsoft Azure and how to, um, you know, kind of put things together. So that's kind of really cool. Um, we could also go to just deployment slots, right? And notice what, what it says is upgrade to standard or premium plan to add slots. And this is what I was talking about before. You can't do uh, CI, CD anymore the way we used to. Uh, but what you can do is if I go to my deployment center and if I click on uh, GitHub and uh, if I authorize it, it's going to ask me to authorize on GitHub like normal. So here it is. And it tells me which ones I want to authorize. I definitely want to grant access to Durham Programmer just like before. In fact, doesn't this look familiar? So here's authorize. Okay. There we go. It tells me I've got a mail that, that's telling me that that's true, right? Email. And let me just refresh this page to see if we're going to get that. Notice it actually says WebD6201 2020 here. Um, so I want to make sure that that is done properly. Yeah. Let's go back to this. Okay, good. So. Here's my deployment center. Good. Now you can see that this is loading, it says. So um, it's loaded in here. I can click on it. I can change my account. And I can specify. I wonder if I have to do it here. Nope. Sorry. I have to tell you this. This changes on a regular basis. OK, cool. So continue. I don't want to use this. Continue. Organization. That's what I wanted. Durham Programmer. Repository. I can specify the one that I want. Yeah. See this thing? What it tells me? Again, this is like Microsoft Azure, right? So we did this, but let's see what this says. Um, and this is all new stuff. I think I may have to go to GitHub to enable the service to work properly. But anyways, as you can see, um, it's much a little bit more involved um, than what I'd like to do. Yeah, so the, right here we should actually be able to pick uh, the repository that I want. Let me just go back to that configuration here for a second while we're running out of time. Um, Azure app, make sure that you pro your repository root has the correct files in your project. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. And server.js, an app.js, or package.json with a script. We got that. Um, so that's if that's these are the different things that you would need to make it run. And authorize Azure apps. So I want to go to app services. And then it says go there. Yes, we did this. Enable continuous deployment. We did all this stuff. Use app service as a build server. Okay, we can. Maybe we missed that part. Let's go back um, to that one. So this. Continue. Yeah, but we don't have this yet, and I'm wondering if we have to refresh. Yeah, it doesn't like when I do that. One more time. Yeah, so it doesn't like that somehow. I want to see if I have other ones. Does it pick up the other ones? Yeah, it does those. Isn't that interesting? 
it's almost like I have to enable something on the GitHub side, right? Like it says. Let's go back to this one. So what do I have to do on the GitHub side? Uh, drop down organization repository branch you want to deploy continuously. You don't have to see settings, uh, applications, authorized OAP apps. Browse your GitHub repository. Okay, so let's do that. So let's go to do this. We're doing that. So that is on GitHub. Bear with me, guys. We'll do this together. We go through this journey. So settings. This is all new. And what did it say? Settings, applications, authorized thing. Okay, settings. Actions, manage access. Maybe this, maybe it's this now. Manage access. Nope. Integrations and services, maybe? Nope. And how about here? Third party access, maybe? Oh, here is uh, OAuth apps. Okay, let's see what that does. So it says go there, select Azure App Service, and then say, select Grant. See, I didn't see that. Settings applications. No. Security. Anyways, I think you get the picture. I think we're very close to getting this done. Webhooks, third party access, maybe. It says it's approved. Azure App Service. It says approved. Yeah. Installed GitHub apps, repository topics, leader repositories, project teams, and then how about GitHub apps? Yeah, so you can see it's slightly different. Register an application, maybe? No. No. Yeah, this is different. So even the the um, information that they have up on on uh, Azure is slightly off, slightly different than this. And it could be just propagation. It could be that it takes a moment for this to happen. Let me just go back to my overview and try it one more time. Sometimes, like I said, it takes an extra minute uh, or so to authorize. And sometimes it's just something that we're missing and it needs a lookup. You can always do it manually with a FTP push as well. So if you have FileZilla, you can go through here and push things up online as well. Okay, so that's definitely something you can do. And is Microsoft causing problems again? Sure. Microsoft is always interesting to use. Yeah. Yeah, see, this was not really doing its thing here. So I'm going to go back. I'll figure this out. But for now, like I said, I recommend Heroku. And I, I just haven't had a chance to go through this, um, this process lately. But it seems to be... Um, something that is it should look like this which is exactly what I, what what we saw with Heroku with the branch that is looking at and all that stuff and then we're good to go it'll just like literally uh, push it up but I know that um, at times we have to authorize it and that's the one part that I'm I'm not seeing because we did all this stuff all this stuff is good it's just the github um, the github page on the configure page for GitHub, drop down and select organization repository branch you want to deploy continuously. If you don't see any repositories, go to your GitHub repository. Okay, let's go. Maybe my, maybe it's this specific repository. One more time, and then we'll stop. Sorry, I'm a little bit of a diehard. Like, I, I don't like giving up. I'm sorry. So, Durham Programmer, going back to my repository. And I want to go to settings.
Yeah, see, I don't see that here. Integrations and services. Webhooks, manage access and options. I'm going to have to look this up, guys, like I said. Anyways, uh, let's get back to what we were talking about before. So today, um, when we go back to this, I'm just going to view my presentation for a second. So a couple things that we want to talk about uh, while we end. One thing is that Lab um, 4 has been released. So for people who join late, um, please take a look at Lab 4. Uh, that's up now. It's going to be due next week, uh, Saturday at... Um, at midnight which is pretty good right so I think that's a that's a good thing um, so that's that's lab four and one part of lab four is this part which is putting it up on Heroku uh, or Microsoft Azure or one of the services I recommend Heroku it's nice and easy for you and it's it it kind of simplifies the uh, the deployment process it's very straightforward and it mirrors what it's like to, to do it in other platforms again uh, it re sometimes they require different access as you saw Sometimes they require other, um, you know, kind of signups and everything else. And again, if it's too complex, don't make it complex. This is a learning experience. So we're, we're this is not a, a cloud services class, but we do use a cloud service for for Node. Otherwise, how how would you uh, share your files? Sharing your files with me is one thing. Sharing your files with the world, well, that's something else. Okay, so that's where we're going to end today. Any questions before we um, uh, we continue? All right, guys, so that's it for me for today. Um, I will see you all next week on Monday. Um, and again, if for those people who haven't had, had a chance to hand in Lab 3, you have a chance. There's, there's amnesty uh, on Lab 3 until uh, this week, uh, Friday at midnight. Okay, so please hand that in, and that way we're all up to date. I can get all the marking done for all those things, and then we can move on uh, to the next part of our course. Okay, otherwise... See you later. I'll stick around for a few minutes if there's any questions. Thank you. Okay, Hamza, just stick around after this then. If you need, if you have some questions, and stick around. All right. I'm going to stop recording here. Um, if there's nothing else, because we're recording live on YouTube.